Joshua Lewis with The Remnant Radio. The video you're about to watch is a production from our ministry. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We broadcast every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time here on YouTube. Uh, we have different pastors, teachers from different churches and denominations coming on the show to discuss a wide range of theological topics. Many of our guests we agree with and many of our de guests we disagree with, but our goal is to understand God's Word so that we can then understand the God who has given us His Word. Uh, so we hope that you enjoy this conversation. We hope it's been a benefit to you. Uh, if you do enjoy this video and want to continue to help us produce content like this, we'd ask that you go down into the description of the video and donate. There's a, a description link there in the video, and it would help us continue producing content just like this. Be blessed. Hey guys, we are talking about post-millennialism. Uh, we've got Doug Wilson on a Skype call. Uh, if you can't tell, we are here um, in a different space. We are not using our normal uh, uh, Remnant Radio studio space. It is under demolition. It will soon be up, uh, hopefully, soon in the next two weeks. it'll be under weeks. construction. It'll be under construction. Yeah, we've been <laughs> you deconstructing. you got to break it down. And now we're, we're constructing. Which we might do some of that today, yes, theologically speaking. That, that is correct. That'll be fun. Uh, uh, hey, so you, you're you actually about to teach through the book of Revelation. You are going to yes. uh, be diving into that. That's why we're actually doing shows on this, so that you can <laughs> so I can secretly we can figure out what, you, what know. you think about this. I'm, I'm through like the easy part the first five chapters. Now I got to get into the hard stuff. So, okay. uh, so Pastor Doug, maybe you can help us out a little bit. Let, let's introduce yeah. our guest. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Pastor Doug, tell us a little about yourself and your ministry. Well, thanks for having me on. My name is Douglas Wilson. I'm the uh, senior minister at Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, Moscow, Idaho is in the panhandle or the chimney of Idaho. So we're up in the beautiful part of Idaho. Uh, it's, uh, it's gorgeous here. Uh, I've been pastoring here for 40, 40 years, same church for 40 wow. plus years. Um, married, brought my, uh, brought my three kids up here. They're all married. They all live here. And I have 17 grandkids. So that's, that's great. Wow. That's the so short form. Our, our, our talk today is going to be on uh, what is considered post-millennialism, what's called post-millennialism. I, I want to have you unpack that before we dive too far into our conversation and questioning. But for those who are out there watching the live stream, feel free to ask your questions. We will be addressing those throughout the program. So if you have questions, keep them coming. Uh, so, so uh, Doug, tell us a little bit about post-millennialism. What is that and how, how can we kind of understand okay. it? Um, it's, it's great to start with definitions. Um, it's a somewhat unfortunate that the three main positions on eschatology, which is the study of the last days. So there's, and there's two forms of eschatology. There's eschatology that deals with heaven and hell, sort of the ultimate final, uh, final day. And there's eschatology that has to do with the end of human history. There are three basic views about eschatology in that latter sense, the end of human history. Uh, there's the pre-mill, pre-millennial, amillennial, and post-millennial. And these three, and the thing that's somewhat unfortunate is that the word millennium occurs in one place in the Bible, and that's Revelation chapter 20. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most difficult chapters in one of the most difficult books in the Bible. <laughs> and so all, so all the positions are named after what you think about the second coming of Christ, with reference to that millennium. So the the premillennials, the premillennialists believe that Christ is coming before the millennium, pre. The postmillennials believe that Christ is returning again, the second coming after the millennium, post millennium. And the amillennials are um, uh, the ah is a term of negation. So the amillennialists don't believe in a literal earthly millennium which the premillennialists and the postmillennialists do. So mm -hmm. the premillennialists believe that Christ is going to reign for a thousand years literally on the earth, and he's going to come again before that happens. The postmillennialists believe that there's an, a thousand years, um, either metaphorically or literally, of gospel peace on earth, and Christ comes at the conclusion of that, postmillennial. Then the amillennialists believe that we're reigning spiritually with Christ in the heavenly places, but there's no earthly manifestation of that millennium. Okay. Uh, and now, could you give us maybe your, your sort of like one, two, three, go-to scriptures, some of the, uh, the biggest, most important scriptures in defense of post 
millennialism? All right. Sure. The, the thing that I would uh, encourage people to do is not to trip over the word millennia, because like I said, if you're going to defend your position, you should be able to defend it from all of Scripture. And if the word millennium only occurs in Revelation chapter 20, then you're not going to be able to defend post-mill, pre-mill, or any kind of mill from all of Scripture. Right. Mm -hmm. I, so I prefer to talk about the kingdom. Okay. Right? When Jesus, when Jesus um, arrived on earth, when he began his earthly ministry, he, he was preaching the kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, the apostles do the same thing in the book of Acts. So uh, the, if I wanted to, uh, my go-to passages to defend uh, post-millennialism would be basically uh, um, probably two Psalms, Psalm 2 and uh, Psalm 110, and then uh, various passages from Isaiah, probably Isaiah 11. So okay. uh, with, um, with Psalm 110, it says the and Psalm 110 verse 1 is the most quoted verse mm -hmm. of the Old Testament in the New Testament. The New Testament writers quote that verse more than any other passage in the Old Testament. The Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. All right, so uh, Jesus quotes it, arguing that basically, how is it that David calls his own descendant Lord? Mm -hmm. So Jesus is using it as an argument for the incarnation. Someone descended from David was going to be someone that David looked up to in a worshipful demeanor and calling him Lord. Well, the Lord said to my Lord, so this is uh, God says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Well, who's at God's right hand? Jesus Christ ascended, we're told repeatedly in the New Testament, that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven uh, uh, at the ascension, and he was ushered into the throne room of the Ancient of Days, and he was seated at God's right hand. So then the question is, how long will he be seated there? How long will he remain there? Well, he will remain there until all his enemies are made a footstool, all right? For he must reign, it's 1 Corinthians 15, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. That's 1 Corinthians 15 alluding to uh, Psalm 110. So mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is in heaven now, and he's going to remain in heaven until all his enemies are subdued and under his feet with one exception, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, and that exception is the last enemy, death, all right? So mm -hmm. Jesus is going to come personally at the second coming, and the dead will be raised, and when the dead are raised at the second coming, that's when the last enemy is conquered. But all the other enemies are conquered before that time, before Christ comes again. Now, mm -hmm. if the premillennial view is correct, then, and everything just goes on pretty much the way it has been, and then Christ returns and the dead are raised, then it would have to follow that the first enemy to be destroyed is death. Mm. But Paul says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Mm. So uh, the preaching through the preaching of the gospel and the expansion of the kingdom and the planting of churches and the growth of the kingdom through all the, throughout all the world, all the enemies of Christ are going to be subdued to him. The world mm. will be successfully evangelized and... Everything is going to be brought under his feet, with one exception, death. And then he's going to return personally to do that. So that would be how I'd handle Psalm 110. Okay. Psalm 2. And, Go ahead. Okay. And then, um, and so where does the casting of Satan into a lake of fire, where does that happen for the post-millennial perspective? So that's obviously um, another enemy that will be destroyed. And so... Right pre-death, right? Because death's the last enemy. So we're just, where does that fall in the scheme? Right. So you have a number, this is, um, first, you're alluding to what is described in Revelation 20, which is, like I said earlier, a, uh, a challenging passage to interpret. But let's mm -hmm. contextualize it. The Bible tells us in a number of places about how the devil is already defeated. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jesus says, uh, you can't 
rob the strong man's house until after you tie him up, right? Uh, so Jesus is the one who binds the strong man and pillages his house. Uh, Jesus came to die, as it says in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus came to die in order to destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Right? So 2,000 years ago, the devil was destroyed. To destroy mm -hmm. him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Or in Colossians, where Jesus, in his crucifixion, made a public humiliation of the principalities and powers mm -hmm. by, by his crucifixion. So there's something about the death of Christ that, uh, that, that topples Satan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I take, jumping back to answer your question about Revelation 20, I don't believe that Revelation 20 teaches that the devil will be annihilated or vaporized. I think that he, uh, if you look at the, the passage, it's, it's the binding of Satan. And I believe that Satan is bound with regard, it says, says this specifically, he's bound with regard to his ability to deceive the nations. Right. So if you look at the Old, the Old Testament empires like Babylon or Persia, uh, the great empires of the Old Testament had a spiritual force behind them. The, the Tyre had a, a, a spiritual mm -hmm. entity behind uh, them. Uh, when Daniel is praying, uh, the angel shows up three weeks late and says, I would have been here earlier, but I got in a fight with the prince of Persia on the way. Right. So th there are spiritual forces behind the ancient empires of Babylon and Persia and, and, and Greece and so on. And I believe that uh, Satan is bound with, with respect to his ability to do that. Mm -hmm. So there's no there is no uh, more possibility in the Christian era of a new Babylon arising or a new Persian Empire or, or a new Roman Empire. There have been attempts. The Third mm -hmm. Reich was an attempt to do that, but it came crashing down within just a few short years. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, so I've got two questions uh, that have come in from different people that I think you can probably, uh, they're softballs. They're, they're pretty nice. You, can, you should be able to knock them out real quick. Uh, we've got uh, BJ Allen asked the question about Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father. If Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father and this inaugurates or initiates this period of time where, where the, uh, the Father is making all of his enemies his footstools, ha hasn't Hasn't uh, Jesus been sitting at the right hand for at least a thousand years now? Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, uh, you addressed not to get too caught up on the millennium. But then I've got another question from someone whose name I won't even pretend to uh, uh, pronounce. Uh, but they said that they are a post-millennial, uh, uh, not the post-millennial, they are a uh, preterist. And they want to know if uh, the post-millennial position is more of a preterist position or a futurist position. Okay, so um, great. The, um, the first... Um, the first is that you have to divide post-millennialists naturally into two camps, right? Mm. Um, and most of one camp is dead. <laughs> um, uh, but the 19th, I should the have 19th laughed at that. <laughs> I, I feel bad now. Um, Poor they're guys. All in, they're all in heaven. Uh, the 19th century post-millennialists tend all, so all post-millennialists believe that the church age, the Christian era, which is 2,000 years thus far, and it may go for another 10,000 years, we don't know, that that Christian era is one of gospel triumph. The older post-millennialists in the 19th century believed that, but they believed in a literal 1,000 years, which was the concluding 1,000 years of the, of the church era. Mm -hmm. So the older post-millennialists said there's going to be this glorious time of thousands of years, the last thousand years of which is a literal millennium. So they mm -hmm. were post-millennials, but they didn't believe that we were in the millennium now. Most contemporary post-millennialists simply take the millennium as a symbolic representation of the church age. So if the church age goes for 7,000 years, the thousand years of peace represents that church age. Okay. So then the second question you had had to do with preterism. Uh, preter is the Latin word for past. And so basically a preterist is someone who, who believes that, um, that the prophecies of the New Testament were fulfilled 
in the future of the person who made the prophecy, but in our past. So many common prophecies that people think are talking about the second coming of Christ, preterists believe were fulfilled in the first century. Now, contemporary postmillennialists are almost all what I would call partial preterists. Okay, they they take most of the prophecies of the New Testament that people usually attribute to the coming of Christ and apply it to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That would mean that the fulfillment of Matthew 24, let's say, Matthew 24 is not talking about the end of the world. Matthew 24 is talking about the end of Jerusalem. So that happened 2000 years ago in 70 AD. And so my view of Matthew 24 would be a preterist view. Again, there were postmillennialists who weren't preterists, but most contemporary postmillennialists are partial preterists. They do believe most um, most orthodox postmillennialists are, I say, partial preterists because any prophecy that has to do with the resurrection of the dead at the end of the world, we are we are still futurists when it comes to those prophecies. Right. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about the difference between amillennial and postmillennial, because I've noticed that you've uh, you've noted uh, several similarities. One, uh, the and just to to bring these up, you didn't necessarily call these similarities, but I'm making these identifications, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, one is that both the amill and postmill perspective often uh, often interpret a, a bulk of uh, say whether it be Revelation or Matthew 24 as preterist, with the exception of certain like resurrection uh, type right. passages or Jesus return. Uh, there's a willingness to to maybe interpret more symbolically rather than literally, whereas the pre mill is more in the literal camp. And then uh, you also talked some about the binding of Satan as being in Revelation 20 something right. that happened in the past through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So all of these are are very similar between post mill and all mill. Um, and what would you say are the chief differences between the two? Now, before I give you a, a chance to answer that question, we have a quick word from our sponsor, and then we'll come back and revisit it. Hey guys, the song you're listening to right now is from Stonebridge Worship. Now, Stonebridge is sponsoring this episode of Remnant Radio, and last week they sent us a Dropbox link to this full album. And I'm telling you, this album is awesome. It's edifying. The quality is spot on. And if you haven't checked out Stonebridge Worship, just go over to your Spotify channel and type in Worthy Is Jesus. That's the song you're listening to right now. Uh, the song is amazing. Uh, and, if, and if you don't have Spotify, man, go check out their YouTube video link. I put it in the description of this video at the bottom. You can watch the full music video that you're watching right now. And another, man, big thank you to Stonebridge Worship and sponsoring this episode of Remnant Radio. Am I back? <laughs> All right. So uh, the question, differences between post-mill and all-mill. Um, great. I, before jumping to that, I, I did want to say one thing about a passing comment you made about the premillennialists. Yes. Um, and that has the, the literal symbolic thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You're right that the all-mills and the post-mills generally interpret certain passages symbolically in a similar way. That is the similarity. But it's not over against the literalism of the premills because they they interpret symbolically also, but mm -hmm. they just interpret a, with a different set of symbols. Uh, okay. And they like to pretend that it's literal. So, <laughs> Scorp uh, Ooh, so uh, I want to hear a little bit about this. <laughs> can, can we park on well, that for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, if, whatever whatever you see in the book of Revelation, if you find Apa Apache helicopters in the book of Revelation... <laughs> You, you They're clearly you in there. Do it. You would have to do it by means of symbolism. Right. right? Yes. Right. So that's a symbolic interpretation. But nobody says that. Oh, you you guys interpret the Book of Revelation symbolically because you come up with Apache helicopters. Right. Right. The Scorpions, that, that's the interesting. That's a good good point. Okay. Yeah. So back to the Amil post mill thing. 
um, the the difference. You, you're right that you you could read an amillennial uh, exegete uh, uh, for any number of passages and not be able to tell if he was amill or postmill, right? I could read I could read an article by an amillennial guy working through Matthew 24, profit by it, agree with much of it, um, if not all of it, mm-hmm. and not know that he was amill. Right. In fact, I read a um, I read a book by an millennialist one time, um, and I thought I, the whole time I thought he was post mill. So <laughs> uh, there there is the um, there there is the possibility of blurring or smudging the the edges. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the difference between the millennialist and the post millennialist is this: the post millennialist has optimism with regard to the course of the gospel in this world. Yes. So the, the amillennialist believes, if we're talking about what happened to, to Israel in the first century and what happened, uh, how the book of Revelation relates to the first century, how Matthew 24 relates, you're probably going to come up with a lot of agreement between a mm-hmm. post-mill and an amill. Okay. If we're talking about what's going to happen in the future of 2020, then you're okay. going to have the expectation of the post-millennialist that things are going to get better and better as the gospel progresses throughout the, the world. And the amillennialist will believe that there will be advances and setbacks, but things will pretty much go on the way they always have. Yeah, so I, I've got uh, just a question on that that optimism. You know, Second uh, Timothy chapter 3 talks about perilous times that are coming in the end. How is it that post-millennial... I, I always get afraid that I'm going to say premillennialism on accident instead of postmillennialism. So I got to make sure I get my 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 uh, uh, prefix. Prefix. I was going to say preposition. I was going to get that wrong too. Uh, uh, my prefix correct. So uh, when talking about postmillennialism, how do you interpret those passages that say that the end times are going to stink? Uh, sure. It sounds like what you're telling me is that the end times are going to be awesome. That as we're wrapping this thing up, Jesus is going to be glorified yeah. more and more. More people are coming to salvation. Of the gospel message is going out, and it is in fact conquering and winning. The world is coming to salvation. Yes. So how do you how do you parse that uh, those those warning passages about those end times? That's that's where preterism comes in. So when someone says in the last days, thus and such will happen, uh, the first question that comes to my mind as a post mill is the last days of what? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about, too often? Modern evangelicals just simply assume the last days of the space-time continuum, the last days of the the cosmos, the last days of the world. Well, uh, post-millennialists, preterist post-millennialists will take a number of passages, including the one you just mentioned, as the last days of the Judaic aeon. So God worked with his people over centuries in the Old Testament, and that age was coming to a close. The, the the Judaic aeon ended convulsively in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. The Christian aeon began 40 years before that. So there was overlap between the two, like, a, like the exchange of a baton in a relay race. So mm-hmm. there was a time when the Judaic aeon was coming to a close and the Christian aeon had been launched. So the Christian aeon was launched in uh, right around uh, 30 AD, uh, with Pente- at the day of Pentecost, and the Juda- Judaic aeon finished in 70 AD. All right, so uh, when the New Testament writers, I, I believe that the New Testament was overwhelmingly, if not entirely, written during that 40-year period, where you had the Judaic aeon wrapping up and the Christian aeon starting. And so when they say in the last days, last days of what? Last days of Jerusalem, last days of the Judaic Aeon, last days of the Old Covenant. That's how I take it. Okay. All right. So um, another, uh, actually, sorry. Uh, I want to come back to the just the optimism thing or, or really just, just stick with that. And so uh, could you just maybe speak to, I've heard you just in some of your YouTube videos talk about, you know, Jesus being the Savior of the world and and just some of the scriptural undergirding for your optimism. So rather than necessarily saying, hey, 
defend why you view this in a preterist way. I'd like to maybe let you go a little bit on offense uh, as sure. why you think this is such a big deal, why you, uh, why you think that the, the Scripture is teaching that we should be optimistic about how the, the gospel is going to go forth and, and conquer and, and bear fruit, right. etc. Yeah, if, if you gave me, an, if I were going to speak to a premillennialist conference, Mm -hmm. on this topic and they promised to be nice to me and they gave me one time slot one shot you've got one shot to talk about this what would i talk about well i would talk about the love of god i talk about the love of god for the world mm -hmm. god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son um and but that's the most famous verse in the bible john three sixteen. you see it at all all the ball games but what's the next verse for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. So what, what are we talking about? The reason I'm optimistic about the world is because Jesus died for it, okay? Jesus died for the world. Um, uh, behold the Lamb of God, um, John the Baptist says, who takes, away the sin of the, um, who takes away the sin of the world. In 1 John, he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, 317, John 317. But what do most evangelicals think Jesus is going to do when he comes again? They think he's going to condemn the world. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> but, but God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the, the reason I'm optimistic is because if you couple these universal uh, passages about the, the atonement of Christ— with the fact that I'm a Calvinist who believes in definite atonement, I believe that the atonement doesn't give you a shot at getting saved, or it's not a redemption roulette. Um, it's when Jesus dies for you, it secures your salvation. So those for whom Christ died are going to be saved. Mm -hmm. If Christ died for the world, the world is going to be saved. That's why Jesus is called the savior of the world. He's not called the potential savior of the world if they only believe, but they probably won't. <laughs> That's not what it is. It, it would have been too long. Maybe, is that the only yeah. reason? <laughs> What's that? It's uh, in the Amplified. You're not looking in the Amplified Bible. That's where I'm it is. Not. Yeah. No. He, he's, the, he's, the, he's the actual savior of the world. That's good. Right. So, but you're not a so universalist means, at the same time. So right. I believe I believe in hell. I'm... I'm I, b I believe that hell is a terrifying reality. I, I believe that people go there, but I don't believe the world is going there. So, so help us with this. When, when, we, when, we, uh, uh, when I hear people talking about post-millennialism, what I frequently hear is people showing up and saying, well, you keep saying that the world is going to get better, but like uh, you look at the Middle East and, and the way that they are uh, taking advantage of uh, uh, underprivileged individuals. Uh, if you look at China, where people are losing their life for their faith. If you look at different areas across the world, we still see the world as bleak as it's ever been. Uh, uh, what, what makes you think that the world is getting, do you see any evidences that would point to uh, the world actually becoming better because of the Christian witness? Yes. So I, I would say that people are not looking at the world. Uh, they're not zooming in at the. They're not zooming in on their time lapse map. In the, they're not using the right increments. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I could, um, uh, PGA PGA O'Rourke one time said that he could he could uh, make the case for progress in one word, and he said dentistry. <laughs> 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 right. So would you would you rather just whatever what in terms of medical technology, in terms of political civil rights, in in terms of religious liberty, in terms of life expectancies, whatever you know, all those all those metrics, would you rather be alive today or five hundred years ago? Five hundred years ago or a thousand years ago? A thousand years ago or fifteen hundred years ago. Right. Well, if 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 I had to go to the airport and decide where I was going to fly, where I was going to go, I'd want to go to now. Okay, and, I, and I'm just speaking in terms of um, uh, what how bad the world is. Right, the the bulk of the world lived five hundred years ago. 
99% of the people in the world lived in grinding poverty. <laughs> grinding poverty. And when mm -hmm. I was born in 1950, that was still true of the overwhelming majority of the people in the world. Within the last few decades, uh, uh, to hundreds of thousands, millions of people have been lifted out of grinding poverty. Things, things are getting objectively better on a material level. If you say, yes, but that's material, we're not materialists, we're not idolaters, I'd say, okay, fine. Uh, South America is turning Protestant right now today at a faster rate than Europe did during the Reformation. Okay, mm -hmm. Africa is becoming Christian. Africa, and the reason for the Islamic blowback in um, in sub-Saharan Africa, just below the Sahara, has to do with panic. Not it's it's not they're they're not confident. They're losing Africa. The the Muslims used to have a hegemonic uh, control over at least the northern part of Africa, which they're rapidly losing. Um, China is in the process of becoming Christian. It, in other words, this is the golden. This is the golden age of mission. Are the, yeah, the, yeah. Christians are losing their lives. Yes, Christians are being imprisoned. That doesn't keep it from being a golden age. That's that's how we conquer. Right. That's how we win. Okay. Good. And um, do you believe that the my understanding of post mill is that there's really kind of two views as to when the golden age began. And I guess you might have addressed this earlier. So I apologize if I missed missed this in your answer. But um, do, are you in the camp that believes the golden age began kind of at the turnover of the age from the Judaism to the uh, the age of the kingdom and, and Pentecost and after that? And we've been in golden age ever since. Or do you believe it happened you know, sometime later, or do you believe it will happen sometime in the future? I mean, I guess you believe it's happening now. I believe, when did the yes, golden I, age begin? I, I believe the millennium um, began in 30 AD with Pentecost, okay, and that the Judaic age ended in 70 AD, and so mm -hmm. the millennium began then. I I would say uh, if, but if you walked around and looked at the world 150 AD. After I wouldn't call it a golden age yet, mm -hmm. because the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is like a mustard seed that grows slowly, or it's like yeast that a woman puts in three measures of flour. It 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 works through the loaf. It's a process. Slow, mm -hmm. It's a process. So uh, I do believe with the older post millennialists that at the end of the millennium we will be able to see with our eyes that it's a golden age. We, mm -hmm. we will be able to see tangibly, palpably that Christ is ruling. Uh, right now, we see it by faith. Okay. It, now, this was one of our listeners, and you guys are so, I think it was G.E. Carlin. Uh, he has this question, and and I'm sorry, we just, we can't get away from this Revelation 20, Pastor Doug. But, okay. uh, <laughs> but this is, uh, I think, a good question. G.E. Carlin, uh, he says, how does Satan being released off his chain fit in with the post-mill view? What will the world look like when this happens? So uh, to summarize for our viewers, um, what, what he's talking about is that Revelation 20, it talks about how Satan uh, is bound for a thousand years, but then at the end of that, he'll be released. And so yes. if, he, if it's true that Satan was bound 2,000 years ago through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, it, what does him being unbound even mean symbolically, or what does that even look like in the post-mill yeah. view? So I'm, um, I'll say personally I'm not settled on that particular part, but I can tell you what most post-millennials think about that. Um, historically, what they say is that the, go the gospel is going to be victorious. The world is going to be successfully Christianized. All the nations will have come to Christ. And then Satan will be released at the last so that, and the argument is so that we will not give ourselves the credit. Of, you know, it, it'll be easy when, when things are going so well for us to say, oh, it's not the gospel. It's not Jesus. It's, you know, uh, we've, we're just civilized. We've got our act together. Um, when Satan is released, there will be a brief abortive rebellion right at the end of all things, and okay. that rebellion will be immediately quashed. Okay. 
Now, is this the rebellion where it's like the the Gog and Magog and uh, all the kings and uh, nations gathering together for battle? Is that what you're referring to? They they, they surround the beloved city and yeah, and uh, so it looks dire for a, a little bit there, but. And that's according to the view. They, you have to take account of Satan wrecks some havoc at the end of the millennium. Uh -huh. And so uh, post-millennialists don't believe that it's all going to be unicorns and fluffy cl clouds up till the, <laughs> the Lord comes again. There, okay. there, will be, uh, the, there will be a sharp conflict, a sharp war of some sort at the end of the millennium. So, so speaking to the proverbial unicorns uh, and puffy clouds, can we can we talk about uh, how this affects government and education? And uh, there there seems to be a growing movement within kind of the Pentecostal charismatic vein called Seven Mountains, and and it came about through someone having a dream, as things do in the Pentecostal charismatic world, uh, and and they decided that God was uh, assigning them to take over areas of influence like the government and uh, education systems and arts and entertainment those kinds of things. This sounds in many ways very similar to that, though it didn't come from a dream or vision. It in fact came uh, from scripture. Uh, help us understand what is the Christian's responsibility uh, in impacting the world from this post-millennial perspective? Yeah, from a post-mill per perspective, basically post-millennialists are generally Kyperian in their view of the, the church's cultural engagement. So we, we would want the church to be salt and light in business, salt and light in education, salt and light in arts and entertainment, salt and light in literature, salt and light in politics, and so on. So, so yes, we believe that when it comes to cultural engagement, we have got to let the clutch out. We, we can't just be regular people go worship differently on Sunday and keep it irrelevant. We have to take, take what we believe and apply it to the actual world. So, so do, do, or I say, does the average post-millennialist uh, hold to kind of a theonomy view of government that Christians should in fact find ways to, uh, because uh, I know in, in, in America, we have a difficult time of understanding the separation between church and state, uh, and if Christians should actually follow that as a way to not affect policy. Uh, how, how do you understand that? I've, I've seen you do quite a bit of work on this, talking about this and how Christians should get involved, and I just want to make sure that we, we at least talk about that, since that's been uh, such an impactful part of, of, of me studying yeah. this, as how Christians should get involved in some of these areas. So when um, one of the things we do when we talk about these things is that we trip over the word— Mm -hmm. So if you uh, if you use the word theonomy for a lot of Christians, that's a scary that's a scare word. It's a oh no, he believes in theonomy. Well, theonomy simply means God's law, and we're living currently under uh, man's law. Man's law thinks that a boy can be a girl. Man's man's law thinks that that two homosexuals can marry. Man's law is dictating these absurdities to us. And when Christians kick and say, that's, that's absurd, I don't want to live under that, well, the only alternative to man's law is God's law, okay? So, uh, but, I, but because people, when they hear the word theonomy, they think about, um, you know, they, they automatically jump to executing homosexuals or, you know, something like that. Sure. Um, I mm -hmm. would prefer to, I'd prefer to talk about uh, the kingship of Jesus Christ. All all societies are theocracies. The only the only thing that separates one society from another is who is Theo. <laughs> you know, that's a very good point. All right, all right what's so the people what's the God or of, right? What's, what's the god of the system? Yeah. Okay. In in American secularism, demos. It, we live in a democracy. So demos, the people, are the god of the system. Mm -hmm. Demos, the people, demand what they demand, and that's the way it is. Well, I'm a Christian, so I believe that Jesus ought to be the ultimate authority. And, and Jesus says in the Great Commission, this is another reason for being post-mill, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth, notice, not just all authority in heaven, 
but all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. Therefore go, disciple the nations. And the direct object of the verb disciple there is nations. He doesn't say go into all nations and get a reasonably sized Bible study going. He, he doesn't <laughs> say uh, get, get at least 1% who can hide in catacombs. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, therefore go disciple the nations, t uh, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. So we, we are commanded to Christianize the world. Hmm. That's the Great Commission. Christianize mm -hmm. the world. Okay, and I, I think our response ought to be, okay. Well, if we're teaching the world yes, to obey everything that Jesus said, then how's that not theocratic? Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just put out there two scriptures that I'm sure you hear these all the time when you talk about Jesus is he's gonna save the whole world. He's gonna and I know you're not a universalist, but when you use this grand language to talk about you know the world becoming Christianized and all of this, uh, one scripture Matthew seven narrow is the or broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. That's one of them. Okay, the other scripture, Luke 18, I believe it's verse 9, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Seemingly, the uh, implied answer would be no, that he's not going right. to find much. Okay, so how would you respond to uh, Matthew 7 and Luke 18? Okay, so let, let me do Luke 18 first. I'll do that in a more summary way, although I hope it's adequate. This goes back to this, the point I was making about the last days. Uh -huh. Postmillennialists believe, preterists and postmillennialists believe that the second coming of Christ is not the only coming of Christ. They believe that Christ came in judgment on Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So when, when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, that was an act of judgment from Christ himself, judging the city that had, um, that had so grotesquely mistreated him and rejected him. And he tells, he tells the high priest when he's on trial, you will see the Son of Man, right? You will see the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. um, so when Jesus says, um, and this is what, why the high priest tore his robes and said, you've heard the blasphemy, etc. But Jesus is quoting Daniel 7, mm -hmm. the Son of Man. I saw the ones like a Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, but he's not coming on the clouds of heaven down to earth. He's coming in the clouds of heaven into the throne room of the Ancient of Days. Mm -hmm. And there he's given universal dominion. So when, uh, when Jesus says, when, he, when the Son of Man comes, when, when you know, he comes, will he find faith on the earth? I think it's talking about the last days of Jerusalem. And the answer is, is no. <laughs> or, mm -hmm. Right? All, all, yeah. the believers, all the believers had been told to get the heck out of there. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies— Head for the tall grass. So that um, I think all the, all of that has to do with uh, uh, AD seventy. Now, okay. jumping earlier to Matthew seven, broad is the way, narrow the way, narrow the way to life. What many Christians have done is they've made that sort of uh, a timeless truth that in any given era there will always be more people taking the broad way to hell, and just a handful of people. Um, struggling up the goat trail to heaven. There's a, there's a little tiny or or the sheep trail, not the goat trail. <laughs> uh, right. Only 144,000 get saved. <laughs> right. So, but but again, what is the context? So Jesus, if you look at the parallel passage to that passage in Luke, so in in Matthew, you've broad is the way, narrow is the way. But if you look in Luke. The, the people protest and say, you know, are there few that be saved? And, and Jesus is answering the question. And so then the question is, saved from what? Because the people who were asking the question said, we, we heard you teach in our streets. We, we heard you. We, saw you. we saw what you did. So it's clearly talking about first century, uh, first century Jews who heard Jesus teaching in the streets of Jerusalem. So Jesus answers that the Broadway for the for the first century Jews, the Broadway is the way to destruction, and the narrow way is the way to salvation, and few there be that find it. 
Now, how do we know that that matters? Well, because right after that, in Luke, um, uh, he says, many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. So uh, only a handful of first century Jews make it, and then many Gentiles flood in, and they sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Many will come from east and west, he says. So in the context of one of those passages, Jesus is talking about Gentiles flooding into the church. Right? So... Um, I don't, I don't think you can make it into a universal dictum that one person is saved out of 100, 99 out of 100 always go to hell. I don't think that's the—I just don't think that's right. Right. Okay. All right. No, do you no, want you're good. no I, I see that you've got your Bible verse written down. You're okay. Like, no. Well, um, seems to be I have several directions I could go, but I feel like I should address something that, uh, that a lot of our viewers— I don't even think I could point to one question because we probably had six or seven people bringing up— uh, they're really interested in certain preterist interpretations, especially when it comes to the book of Revelation. Uh, right. A lot of questions about the plagues and the Antichrist and, and just basically everything from Revelation 6 to 19. Uh, a lot of yeah. questions about do you really believe everything except for the return of Christ was in the past? I, I don't expect you to yeah. address every single one of those, but maybe you could hit a few highlights. Okay, um, thank you. This is a great, it's a great question. So um, let me, I'm contrasting here preterism with regard to revelation and futurism with regard to revelation. The first thing to point out about the futurist position is that if I say that the book of Revelation is fulfilled 50 years in our future, it's all going to come to pass in the year 2070. Okay. If, if I say that, if I take that futurist position, the first thing I discover when I'm writing my book is that the future is infinitely malleable. Mm -hmm. that I can make I can make the future, I can make 50 years from now walk on its hind legs. I can make it do anything. I can make it roll over. I can make it bark <laughs> like a seal. I, I, the, the future is something that's it's putty in my hands, right? But if I want to say the book of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century, the first first century history happened the way it did and i don't get to make up my own first century history mm -hmm. so if i if i adopt the preterist view and i apply it to uh, of revelation and i apply it to the first century i'm i'm working within fixed constraints mm -hmm. in a way that the futurist is not working within fixed constraints that's the first thing the second thing is that when you do that you discover and you and you recognize the kind of literature you're reading which is apocalyptic, um, apocalyptic literature, which is highly figurative, highly symbolic. Once you learn how to read it, because Zechariah is ap apocalyptic, Ezekiel is apocalyptic, uh, 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 Daniel, parts of Daniel are apocalyptic. Once you learn how to read that genre of literature, and you look and you're and you're well versed in what actually happened in the first century, a number of things all of a sudden swim into focus. So the first thing, you mentioned the Antichrist. The first thing I'd point out is the Antichrist is not mentioned in the book of Revelation ever. Mm -hmm. The Antichrist is not in there. The beast is in there. In the popular dispensational imagination, the beast is the Antichrist, and the Antichrist is the beast. But in biblical parlance, the Antichrist is a false teacher within the church. Mm -hmm. The beast is a persecuting civil ruler. Okay, so in modern parlance, an antichrist would be a liberal Methodist bishop, okay, um, someone who denies the, G, the uh, a liberal Methodist bishop who denies the incarnation. Uh, he denies that, that Jesus has come in the flesh. John says that's the spirit of antichrist. That's, uh, many antichrists are, are going out. That's, that's false teaching within the church. A beast is a persecuting king or an emperor. OK, mm -hmm. so you look um, uh, you look in Revelation where it says uh, the there's a seven headed beast and the seven heads are seven kings and the mm -hmm. seven heads are seven hills. OK, Rome, if I said the Big Apple, everybody knows I'm talking about New York. If I said the Windy City, everybody knows I'm talking about Chicago. If I said the Big Easy, people know I'm talking about New Orleans. 
If I talked about the city of seven hills in the first century, everybody knows I'm talking about Rome. Rome was built on seven hills. Mm -hmm. And the beast, the seven heads of the seven-headed beast, it says are seven hills. And it says mm -hmm. there are also seven kings. Five were, one is, one is to come. So you start counting with Julius, Julius Caesar, Tiber uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, on down. To five were, the one that is, is Nero Caesar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so five were, one is, and then after that, there will be one for a short time. So right after um, Nero is, are, is the year of the four emperors, Galba, Vitellius, and Otho, uh, and then Vespasian comes back from the siege of Jerusalem to take over. So um, when, when Nero launched the first persecution of the Christians, he did so in 64 AD. Nero was forced to commit suicide in a coup in 68 AD. So the first, the first persecution of the Christian church by Rome happened between 64 and 68 AD, which mm -hmm. is a period of 42 months. Well, the book of Revelation says the beast is going to persecute the church for 42 months. <laughs> hmm, that's great. Uh, what, do you, what do you want? Egg in your beer? You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's clever. Okay. So so what about like uh, even uh, in dialoguing with historic premillennialists, with uh, dialoguing with even people who are amill, they look at uh, partial preterism and they say, hey, man, there's a lot of things that I think uh, were fulfilled in uh, 70 AD or before 70 AD. Uh, however, they kind of see it as this repeated prophetic pattern. So like in, uh, I think it's in Isaiah. I know it's in Isaiah. I think it's in chapter nine uh, where uh, Isaiah takes his son, Ashur Bajashab, and he goes to uh, uh, King Ahab. Ahab, is that correct? Am I Ahab. banging on all cylinders? Ahab. Okay. Goes to King Ahab, Ahab in chapter nine. And he says, hey, and this is going to be your sign. A, a child will be born, right? So he, he goes to a partial fulfillment in the day of Isaiah, but a greater fulfillment at the birth of Christ. So they, they right. make this kind of illustration that uh, uh, apocalyptic, maybe not, that, that, that might not be apocalyptic prophecy, but prophecy can uh, have a partial fulfillment now and a future fulfillment uh, that is completely fulfilled in the, the last day. So so uh, what would you say to those who, who say you're taking your uh, partial preterism to seriously and saying, yes, it was all fulfilled. There is no future fulfillment. Uh, what, what about a potential repeat of what has happened in the past? Well, I, I think that a potential, um, I, first, I believe the point is well taken, and I believe in prophetic echoes or prophetic mm -hmm. rever reverberations. God is a, a storyteller who likes to use the same themes over mm -hmm. and over again. Yeah, right. Amen. So um, you have exile and return all the way through the Bible. You have um, you have the underdog story, all the youngest brother, um, pro all through the Bible. You have death and resurrection patterns all through the Bible. I don't have any problem seeing that what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century would be something that God would bring out of His toolkit again. Right. So, so, and then to this same, to re, I guess, a clarification, uh, Nathan Johnson asked a, a, a very similar question, just saying, hey, you said that the second coming took place at the destruction of the temple. Is there a third coming? Is the third coming the judgment? Or, like, how, how, how do you parse? Probably not his favorite way yeah, to phrase it. Yeah, but. yeah, it probably, yeah. <laughs> He's in, I think uh, the way that the question is worded is actually, uh, uh, is probably a popular way that you're asked this question, I would imagine. Right. So, uh, I believe I, I would prefer to call the coming of Christ at the second, at the end of the world. I prefer to call that the second coming, simply because if you call it anything else, you're going to cause endless confusion. So the, the second coming of Christ is his coming in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay. He returns physically to earth and he um, raises the dead and uh, inaugurates the eternal state. So, I, I would reserve Christ coming in the flesh, but his bodily return, I want to call that the second coming. But I do believe that Christ came in judgment on Jerusalem. It, it was a manifest manifestation of Christ's spiritual authority when he destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Romans mm -hmm. did it, but they were the instrument in the hand of Jesus. Right. 
Okay, I, I have a question about that because um, you talked about, especially like the first time you answered that question in a kind of full way, um, you talked about, I, I want to say it's Matthew 26, around 64 or so, where, um, you know, Jesus is, uh, Jesus is responding. He's saying, from now on, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. So you have this reference to Daniel chapter 7. And the way I understand your point, Doug, that you're making is that, hey, Jesus was, was telling him, hey, you're going to see it. In your lifetime, you're going to see me coming on the clouds of heaven. Thus, this was this sort of, uh, call it an intermediate coming, a coming in judgment on Jerusalem and the temple, etc. Now, that I think correct. that's a really reasonable interpretation. That's the way I understand it. But then I see that same Daniel 7 passage in, say, Revelation 1-7. Of course, Daniel 7 is all over the New Testament. But uh, mm -hmm. in Revelation 1-7, where it talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, and there it says, every eye will see him, it seems to expand beyond just the Jewish people. Would you say that uh, this Revelation 1-7 is just using Daniel 7 in a different way? Are there multiple ways we can use it? Like, hey, in one sense, it speaks of of Christ coming in judgment upon Jerusalem and the temple, but in the Revelation 1-7 sense, it's speaking of uh, Christ's true, what we call the second coming. How, uh, do you understand no, the I question? Think I, I, yeah, it's a, um, the question makes perfect sense. So I don't, I, I believe that you can take it as Daniel 7 is being used in different ways at different levels of expansion, but mm -hmm. not in diametrically opposite directions. So I don't believe you can have Daniel 7 quoted in one place to have Jesus coming into the courts of heaven and then quoted in another place where he's coming to earth. Mm -hmm. I do think that you can see him coming into heaven and you will know that he's in heaven ruling at the right hand of God the Father by looking at the effects of his rule, mm -hmm. right? When, when they look at the effect of Christ's rule in the destruction of Jerusalem, they're going to look on the one whom they have pierced. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to lament because they look on the one whom they've pierced. When everybody is invited to look on the, uh, the, the one like the Son of Man in Revelation 1, I think it's the same sort of thing, where people are being invited to believe on Jesus because they can see the effect of his reign. In the destruction of Jerusalem, the effect of his reign was devastation. In other places, the effect of his reign is glorious liberation. That's good. Okay. Very good. Hey, so we've we've got to wrap up the show. We, we need to go around. We're going to do some closing thoughts. What are some closing thoughts uh, that Michael uh, and Doug both have as people are walking away? Something that they really just want everyone to to consider as they walk away from this interview. Uh, but before we have those closing thoughts, I really want to get you guys to uh, get those reminders set on your YouTube. We've got some videos coming out this week that are just going to be phenomenal. Uh, uh, tomorrow, we've got Pastor Tim Ross for Embassy Church. We've got Matt Chandler from The Village coming on on Wednesday. Uh, we uh, got Jack Deere coming on uh, in uh, June. We've got N.T. Wright coming on in June. We've got some really great interviews that you're not going to want to miss. So uh, if you are watching this right now, let's watch all the way out until we get those closing thoughts. But after this video, make sure to go to our homepage and hit the set reminder button so that you can watch those live. Our usual programming is at Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. But because of Corona, we've been able to snag some of these really great interviews. So make sure to set those reminders. Uh, let me start with Michael. We got some some closing thoughts for today's yeah, interview. Absolutely, uh, Doug. First of all, just really appreciate you. Um, it's really it's really great for us to to have these kind of conversations. I think it sharpens all of us because obviously not yeah. all of our listeners are post mill, and so it's just yeah. great to to have these kind of conversations. And I think you were very gracious and uh, and very well thank informed. You. So thank you. A uh, couple of thoughts. Uh, one, I really love uh, I love the optimism of post millennialism. I I think it's great. Because that that idea that like you know seventeen people are getting into heaven, you know the rest <laughs> like it's honestly discouraging yeah. as a Christian, mm -hmm. and and to just say like hey, the answer is Jesus died for the world. I just I just am inspired by that. I think that's an important inspiration because, it, you know, nobody wants to go fishing in a lake with like in the Dead Sea, right? Nobody wants to go fishing in a lake with no fish, and right. uh, it's inspiring to fulfill the Great Commission and to seek to fulfill the Great Commission when you actually think there might be success in this. This is going somewhere, and so uh, and then just seeing the the fullness of the Great Commission and making disciples in every area of life. Uh, I I just think uh, I I love how you started with kingdom. Let's talk about the kingdom and what it looks like to bring the kingdom as we make disciples. So. Amen. 
Uh, Pastor Doug, uh, some closing thoughts, just people walking away from this video. What do you want them to remember, uh, consider, study, those kinds of things? Yeah, I, uh, I would like them to remember that uh, the world, this world is not God's Vietnam. It's, it's not God. <laughs> oh, uh, man. Not, you know, that was two birds with one stone. That was pretty good. <laughs> it, it's not like he got involved in this fruitless attempt to save a country that didn't work. And then the rapture is us all getting helicoptered out of Saigon. Um, I don't I don't think it's like that. Jesus, uh, Jesus is the savior of the world. So I, I think that this is the sort of thing, even even um, my pre-mill brothers and all-mill brothers, I would love them to walk away thinking, you know, I don't buy it, but wouldn't it be great if it were true? <laughs> <You know? laughs> wouldn't it wouldn't it be great if the world really did come to Christ? And wouldn't it be great if um, the most of the human race winds up in heaven and not in hell? You know, hell is a terrible reality, but wouldn't it be wonderful if the population of heaven vastly outnumbered the population of Amen. hell wouldn't that be Amen. wonderful um, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be wonderful if school children uh, looking back at 10,000 years from now school children were struggling trying to figure out who lived first cs lewis or athanasius you know and they, and they said i can never keep these early church fathers straight um, because <laughs> for for most of the for most of the future church, we are we are the early church. We mm. we're just getting started. This is just beginning. And if you imagine envision a an evangelized world that goes for generation after generation with billions of people each generation loving and serving Jesus Christ and filling up heaven that way, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful? If it were true, that's awesome. Amen. Um, I love it. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you on the show. Uh, we look forward to uh, following your ministry and some of the stuff that you are continuing to produce. Do you have anything that you're really excited about in the upcoming future? Books that you've released, uh, conferences that you're doing. There's, no one's really doing conferences now, but do you have anything that you're looking forward to as far as content yeah, I, producing? Probably, probably the uh, the most obvious thing to connect with would be it ties in with the subject of. Um, of this episode here, and that is a recent, my most recent commentary is a commentary on the book of Revelation, and it's called When the Man Comes Around. So if they go to Canon Press and look for When the Man Comes Around, um, it's a commentary on Revelation, and um, it's all there. That's great. Hey, thank you so much again for coming on. Uh, for those of you who are watching right now, go ahead and hit the like button if you like the video. If you dislike the video, hit the dislike button twice. Make sure to hit subscribe, and we will be back uh, Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time every Monday. Uh, but we'll be as back as soon as tonight. Tonight. We've got Caleb, uh, Caleb Sutherland. Sutherland. Yeah, yeah talking excellent. about church planting movements. It's, it's going to be, be exciting. It's be, that's great talk. So make so. sure you guys subscribe. All right. Thanks, guys. Be blessed. Have a great week. Later.